Assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our MAPS Academy webinar on pipelines into foreign policy careers with a focus on the Council on Foreign Relations, International Affairs Fellowship, and term member programs. My name is Ahmed Mati, board chair of Muslim Americans in Public Service, a national nonprofit member organization that aims to build and formalize community, promote institutional representation, and facilitate the professional development of Muslim American public servants. If you're not already a member, I urge you to join today for free at mapsnational.org to do your part to share your talents and learn from others in our amazing growing national community. Membership is free and inclusive to current inspiring public servants of all faiths or no faith. Uh, MAPS Academy is our in-house learning content curriculum of professional development webinars and tailored one-on-one -on -one support workshops that makes public service more accessible to underserved and underrepresented communities. Uh, we currently host monthly webinars on federal careers and navigating USA jobs, pipelines into non-career presidential political appointments, congressional jobs, judiciary pathways, and daily resume reviews and interview support for our members. Our program this afternoon features uh, Megan Fulco, Managing Director of the Stephen M. Keller Term Member Program at, at CFR, uh, Devin Ferguson, Associate Director of Fellowship Affairs at CFR, and Aliyah Kaiser, Associate Director uh, for Studies and Administ Studies Administration and Fellowship Affairs uh, at CFR. Uh, and our panel is moderated by MAPS, MAPS board member and CFR International Affairs Fellowship alumna, Mariam Safi. For those that aren't familiar with the Council on Foreign Relations, it's a leading think tank specializing in U.S. foreign policy and international relations. It's founded in 1921, I think. Uh, it was publishing their well-known bi-monthly journal Foreign Affairs since 1922. I recall giving um, former CFR President uh, Richard Haas and his son a uh, tour of the United Nations 20 years ago when I was a State, <laughs> Department, when I was a State Department intern with USUN. Uh, he stepped down this summer, I think, and is now led by Michael Froman. Uh, we'll be learning a lot more about CFR from our panel, and we'll be sure to circulate all relevant links and materials in the comments and when we share this recording. Uh, our program will begin with brief remarks by our speakers, followed by some questions and answers from our moderator. And then from our attendees, feel free to add your questions in the chat or briefly ask them when called uh, by our moderator or by myself. Um, please keep yourself muted in the meantime. Okay, our moderator, Mariam Seyfi, is a career diplomat with the US Department of State. She's participating in this panel in her personal capacity, of course, and her views do not represent her institutional affiliations, including the State Department. Uh, Mariam is currently a senior advisor with the newly established Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy at the State Department. She started her foreign service career in Cairo during the early days of the Arab Spring in 2011 and later served in Baghdad during the U.S. military withdrawal from Iraq and a spokesperson for the U.S. consulate in Lahore, Pakistan. Prior to joining the State Department, she was a Peace Corps volunteer in Jordan and an AmeriCorps volunteer in Seattle. Uh, she's an alumna of the Presidential Leadership Scholars and participated in both the Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellowship and term member programs. My name is a graduate of Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, where she focused on human rights and national security in the Middle East and North Africa. Take it away, Mariam. Thank you, Ahmed, and thanks to all of you for joining. Um, I think we'll go ahead and just dive right in. I'm gonna um, introduce our uh, panelists, our co-panelists, um, Megan Fulco. She's the Managing Director of the Stephen M. Kellen Term Member Program at CFR. And in this role, she conceives um, roundtable discussions, workshops, conferences, screenings for more than 750 term members worldwide. I did not know that. <laughs> I benefited from all of this as a term member, and it's pretty extraordinary. Um, Megan, before joining CFR, worked as a staff assistant for U.S. Congressman Spencer Bacchus from Alabama and uh, is a graduate of Birmingham Southern College with a BS in International Studies. Devin Ferguson, who'll, who will speak after Megan, is the Associate Director for Fellowship Affairs at CFR. And in this role, she supports the recruitment, selection, and placement of fellows across CFR's International Affairs Fellowship Program, um, including uh, the flagship program, as well as in Japan, and for tenured scholars. Before joining CFR, Devin was the International Program Associate for the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities Commission on International Initiatives. Um, She's also held roles and volunteered extensively with the School of Education at American University. She was, uh, in, she was in Japan as an assistant language teacher with the Japan Exchange Teaching Program and has her uh, master's degree from American University and her bachelor's from UCLA in East Asian Studies and Political Science. And Aaliyah Kayser, 
um, Kaiser is the Associate Director for Studies, Administration and Fellowship Affairs at CFR. She oversees the administration of another chunk of CFR International Affairs Fellowship Programs, um, the IAF in Canada, the, and the one in Indonesia, um, as well as a new one that's uh, focused on European security, which is really exciting. Um, she is um, a graduate of Georgetown University's um, Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. So this is a pretty rock star, phenomenal panel. And I'll go ahead and just um, hand over the mic to, to Megan to talk about CFR a little bit more and the term member program as well. Thank you so much, Miriam, and thank you, Ahmed, for inviting us to do this. And uh, to all of you for taking uh, your, the time to, to be with us today. Um, so Ahmed uh, mentioned a little bit about the council, but I thought before kind of delving into the program that I oversee, the term member program, um, you know, maybe it would make sense to just tell you all a little bit about the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, we, um, you know, maybe are not um, as transparent of an organization as as, uh, as we could be, but um, as as Ahmed mentioned, uh, we were founded in 1921. Um, we are um, an independent, um, nonpartisan uh, organization um, with a membership. So uh, we're also with the think tank. Uh, so we have our studies team, our studies department, which Aaliyah and Devin are part of. Um, and um, we are a publisher of foreign affairs. Uh, so it's really important to us uh, that we are nonpartisan, that the organization takes no institutional positions on policy. We have um, over 5,000 members worldwide. So our role really as an organization is to be a resource um, to those members, um, to um, you know, the business community, government officials, state and local officials, civic leaders, religious leaders, um, educators, students, you name it, um, and to be resources on uh, foreign policy. Um, so, you know, there's a, a lot of different aspects of the council. Um, you know, what I oversee is our Stephen M. Kellen term member program. So uh, this program, we have um, over 750 term members worldwide, um, and it was uh, started in 1950 um, as a way to cultivate uh, the next uh, generation of, of, not 1950, sorry, it was started 52 years ago um, as um, a way to cultivate the, uh, the next generation of foreign policy leaders. So. Um, to be a part of, of the term member program, um, you apply uh, between the ages of 30 and 36, and you have a five-year term. Um, so really, our term members are, are between the ages of, of 30 and 41 years of age. Um, Mid-career professionals, um, they're, um, U.S. citizens are permanent residents. Uh, uh, that's a, a requirement of of joining the program, um, but we do um, all sorts of um, programming and trips and, and professional development workshops for uh, these term members. Uh, the council is headquartered in, in New York City with an office in Washington, and so most of the activity that we provide for our members in person happens in those two cities, um, but we also have a really robust national membership um, with smaller roundtables taking place both for term members and, and life members. Um, in 11 cities uh, throughout uh, the country and in London. Um, the programming we do for term members, so why this might be of interest uh, to you all, um, like I said, much of it is professional development focused. That's um, workshops on um, how to get on a board, how to um, uh, create a podcast, um, how to be an inclusive leader, um, you know, focused on things, again, cultivating uh, this next generation of leaders. We'll also have roundtable discussions um, on everything um, from, you know, the, the, the war in Ukraine to, um, to, you know, emerging markets to, um, you know, what's happening in the Middle East, kind of every range of, of topic um, that could appeal to our membership. Uh, we're doing a lot more on, on tech-related um, uh, subjects. Um, we have an annual conference uh, for term members that happens in the fall. We alternate uh, the location of that between New York and Washington, but we have uh, you know, 400 term members coming from all over to take uh, part in a two-day conference that's everything from you know, large plenary discussions on U.S. policy toward China um, to climate change uh, to smaller breakout discussions on topical and, and regional um, you know, areas of interest, um, you know, keynote uh, uh, plenary discussion. We've had everyone from Susan Rice um, to um, Linda Thomas-Greenfield did it recently. Um, last year, we had the head of NASA come in the keynote. This coming year, we'll have Rajiv Shaw from the Rockefeller Foundation 
um, keynote. Um, so we have one kind of big keynote and, and then the more intimate kind of roundtable discussions that, again, bring term members together. Um, and then um, additionally, we'll do uh, trips throughout the year. So there's, you know, everything from half day field trips to different uh, government agencies um, or businesses. Um, we'll do multi-day trips um, to various cities or military installations um, within the, the U.S. Um, or a full week international trip that happens every few years. Um, but that's all, um, you know, really focused on, um, you know, access to these uh, these leaders in, in these cities or in these corporations and getting those kind of off the record discussions um, that that can be so valuable to people. Um, but I think the biggest thing is is really uh, the the engagement um, member to member. So you know, it's it's when you go on these trips or you come to these roundtables, it's um, you know the interacting with your fellow term members and 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 building those relationships. You know, um, you know, we believe this group of people are going to be really leading our country. Um, you know, sooner than later, and so you build these these networks of of contacts and and build these friendships, um, and they're hugely important. And again, kind of going back to our our nonpartisan, um, you know, founding, we you know everybody has a wide range of views across the spectrum, and it's about you know finding those um, common grounds and the cooperation between the groups. Um, and um, so briefly, I'm, I'm, you know, if there's interest, um, a little bit about the application process to flag for you all. Um, so we do one application round a year. It's typically right after the new year. Um, the uh, deadline for this year is January 10th, 2024. Again, you have to be between the ages of or be 30 to 36. Um, you could turn, you know, 37 on January 5th and you will be that will be your last uh, option to, to apply. Um, so you just need to be, um, you know, 36 in the, the first of the year. So it's January 10th, 2024 is the next deadline. Um, you do have to have a, a nominator um, for a current uh, member of the council, either life or term member. We have those lists online so you can kind of identify folks in your network who might um, be potential nominators for you. And then uh, it's, you provide two to three uh, seconding letters um, from um, folks who can speak to your, um, you know, really your professional background um, and, uh, you know, what your experience has been, um, you know, why the council would really go a long way to help, um, you know, continue building you as a foreign policy professional um, and, and submit those. And then the committee meets in the spring and then uh, people begin their term membership of July 1 of that year. So, um, you know, you all, if, if anybody in this group is, you know, meets the requirements of age and is really interested in going for it uh, this year, you have a few few months to really build your application together and, um, and, and, and submit it. So it's, you know, I think it's a really great opportunity to, to broaden, um, you know, your network um, of, of contacts in, in the foreign policy world. Um, that's just kind of a, a quick overview. I don't want to take time away from from my wonderful colleagues, but I'll I'll leave it there, Miriam. No, so thank you so much, Megan. And I can personally attest to the uh, the lifelong friendships. I think mo a lot of my closest friends I gained from the CFR term member program, um, and we're still quite active. So it's a very like robust alumni, as a, as Megan knows. <laughs> we're still in touch even after I finished, and um, but it's it's wonderful. So um, so Devin, over to you to talk about the International Affairs Fellowship. Um, and and the I know that deadline is coming up pretty soon, so you and Aliyah can can give us more insight. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Perfect. Um, thank you, Miriam, for coordinating the session. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone on the call, for taking the time out uh, to hear hear from us today. My name is Devin Ferguson. I'm the Associate Director for Fellowship Affairs at CFR. Um, and as Megan mentioned, um, in addition to CFR's work as a think tank and publisher, and of course as a membership organization, um, CFR also offers a number of visiting fellowships every year. And so today, uh, my colleague Ali and I have a couple of programs to highlight for you, our International Affairs Fellowship programs, which are open to mid-career professionals and scholars who are U.S. citizens and who have an interest, uh, who have a focus on and an interest in foreign policy, both in their professional uh, and academic um, 
lives. Um, and so as as I think Miriam mentioned, our applications for the IEF programs are open now through October 31st. I would love to get started just talking about uh, our, our kind of main program offering our flagship International Affairs Fellowship. Uh, this program was launched in 1967, uh, the goal being to provide a transformative experience, um, allowing our selected fellows to, uh, you know, mid-career professionals and scholars to experience a new uh, environment at a, at a turning point in their careers. Um, so how the program works is basically it takes fellows uh, coming from outside of, or excuse me, outside of public service, either from academia, the private sector, nonprofits, etc. Um, and places them for a year in government or a policymaking organization, an international organization to gain hands on experience in policymaking. On the other side of things, uh, those coming from public service, either in the US government or the military, um, will spend a year in a scholarly environment, either a university or a think tank, um, and, and you know, having that time to reflect and research and write free from the operational uh, pressures of their, their regular job. Um, Every year, the IAF, the flagship IAF, I should say, awards approximately 10 fellowships. Um, and fellows are, with the help of CFR, placed with a host institution for 12 months and receive a stipend of $120,000 for the year. Um, during the program, uh, fellows work on a wide range of issues and policies from space policy in Latin America, US Korea relations, uh, climate change, and sports diplomacy in Africa. And those are just a few of the most recent topics from our, our current classes of fellows. Um, and previous fellows have been placed in host institutions um, on, on the academic side, in think tanks like the Center for Strategic International Studies, Brookings, um, and then universities like Harvard, George Washington here in, um, in DC, um, as well as in the policymaking space. So Capitol Hill, the Senate and House Foreign, Rela uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committees, uh, Departments of Defense and State, USAID, Commerce, um, as well as international organizations, United Nations, OECD, and many, many others. Um, we have a really illustrious roster of IF alumni uh, that include former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, Ambassador to South Africa Ruben Brigady, and Administrator of USAID Samantha Power. And of course, uh, Miriam, who's with us today, is also an alumni of the program. Um, so that's that's a really quick snapshot of our flagship program. Um, in addition to this program, um, we also seeking applicants right now. We have a number of other fellowship opportunities, um, all of our uh, overseas opportunities, and I will turn it over to uh, my colleague Aliyah to go over those programs. OK, great. Thank you, Devin. Um, Thank you, Miriam and Ahmed for coordinating this information session and inviting me to be part of it. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, so my name is Alia and I'm Associate Director for Fellowship Affairs. We're very excited to talk about these terrific programs um, and see how much interest there is for these types of opportunities that the Council offers. Um, so I'm going to give an overview about CFR's overseas fellowships, and we currently have four active programs. We have the IF in Canada, IF Indonesia, IF Japan, and the newest one, which is the Belfer IF in European Security. The IF in India um, is on hold this year, and we're not recruiting for that fellowship. Um, and as with the fellowship, um, the flagship IEF, these programs aim to provide a transformative experience. So prior experience in any of these countries or working in or even writing about or knowing the local language is not required. Uh, these programs enable you to spend time working and researching a topic of your interest at a think tank, university, international organization, and these countries on issues pertaining to that specific country or to European security. Um, and I think that the mission is that through research on a specific topic, um, you deepen your knowledge um, of these countries and help to strengthen the bilateral understanding and cooperation between the rising generations of leaders and thinkers in these countries and the United States. Um, in terms of the eligibility, they're pretty much similar through uh, the four programs. Um, applicants must be mid-career professionals, have a strong record of professional achievement. Um, obviously, you should express some type of um, degree of interest in either U.S.-Canada relations, or the Indonesia-U.S.-Indonesia relations, uh, U.S.-Japan relations, or your uh, 
in European security. Um, in terms of the award, uh, one to two fellowships each year um, are uh, awarded for each program. I think that the Japan is a little bit different. We award anywhere between three to five fellowships for the IEF in Japan. Uh, the fellowships by and large uh, run through um, anywhere between three to 12 months. And in your application, you can note how many months you would like to carry out. Um, and the stipends for each program vary. Um, so for example, for the Canada, the, the award is $110,000 for a period of 12 months or a prorated amount if the duration is shorter. Um, but each of the fellowships um, pages on our website has the specific uh, uh, details on, on the award for each fellowship. So you can, I definitely encourage you to, to review those. Um, and also each of the fellowship um, stipends um, awards, they are, uh, accompanied with a model uh, with a, a modest travel grant um, to help with your uh, relocation and travel expenses. In terms of the placement, um, CFR, our team will assist you in finding a, um, a host organization that matches your proposed work in each country. Uh, we have established relationships already with many host organizations, um, so we definitely, you know, um, will work with you very closely on that process. We do ask in the application to list, um, I believe three potential um, organizations for the fellowship year, um, but we do not require you at that point to secure a host or even having made a contact. Um, they're only used as a, as a notional starting point um, at this time in, in the process. Um, in terms of the actual applications for each fellowship, um, they're again very similar, um, but the application requirements, they vary slightly for each program, but in general, there's a, a CV, a resume section, your proposal statement, um, which should describe uh, area of research or policy that you would be interested in examining and how you intend to contribute to the breadth of work on that specific topic. And we also require two letters of recommendation. Um, and those are, you know, um should be should be able to assess the importance of the work you're proposing to undertake your qualifications to pursue that work and how the fellowship would further your career development um i think that megan um mentioned that the the term member uh program is one of the uh cfr's approaches to develop the next generation of foreign policy leaders well, I think with our IEF programs, that's just also another approach that we we also try to um, achieve the same goal. Um, so yeah, um, so I uh, definitely recommend reviewing the um, uh, the program pages for each fellowship on CFR.org, and there you will find more specifics about each fellowship program, including the award, the selection process. We also feature our former fellows. Um, you're able to start an application right now. They're live, so um, and the application deadline is October 31st for all the programs. Um, following the application deadline, our selection uh, each of our fellowships has a selection committee. They will review. The, all the applications and you should be notified no, long, um, no later than March of next year about your status. Um, and if you're awarded the fellowship, we will work with you to find um, uh, a host institution that matches your research or policy interests. Um, and once the fellowship year begins, um, you will have access to some of our events, our roundtable meetings, um, and every year we also host an annual conference featuring uh, some of our uh, most recent international international affairs fellows. Um, so you would get an invitation to that. Um, so I know we have thrown a lot of information at you, um, but I do hope that one of these fellowship programs will be of interest to you now or in the future. Um, and you know if there's any questions that you know where i'm unable to answer um today def you can definitely um email fellowships at cfr.org or always contact me um directly um so i think that's it from me and i'll hand over the virtual mic to Miriam. 
Thank you so much. This was wonderful. And, and it's incredible the, the range of opportunities um, and different entry points to, to become a part of CFR. I think um, before we open it up to questions, I'll speak sort of from my own personal experience, having the, been a beneficiary of both programs, the term member program, initially when I first started, um, as well as I learned about the, the IAF, the International Affairs Fellowship, when I became a term member. Um, and I'll say, you know, for me personally, I had a huge public speaking phobia, so I would be scared to even speak in a um, in a in a public setting. And and the person who recommended me actually for the term member program said, you know, this could be a good training ground for you. Just there's no pressure, <laughs> you know. Just you can ask a question in a public space, and you know. And now I'm sure Megan knows, and and I, I'm always asking <laughs> like too many questions at these events. But it was a way for me to to you know sort of become more confident um, and and actually gain mentors. I mean, I had the serendipity of meeting one of them, uh, a mentor who, you know, was, uh, his, her name is Ambassador Diana Dugan at a, an event where she, in post, you know, career, worked, worked on filmmaking. And I was, at the time, I'd just come back from Cairo, my first assignment. Uh, the uprising happened in 2011, and I was sort of obsessed. Like, I think many, the world was sort of watching, but I was sort of physically there. And um, she worked on a film called The Square, which was on Netflix. And um, so we chatted about it, and I talked about, you know, what I liked about it, what I thought, you know, uh, was was really interesting, and even critiques of it and whatnot. And so it just formed this friendship out of nowhere at a dinner table. And uh, she's the one who actually kind of helped coach me when I was doing my International Affairs Fellowship application on like sort of how to refine this, how to make this sort of um, fit with, especially with my career path, because I wasn't quite sure, you know, where I was going. So I think in addition to the professional development that you receive formally, there's this informal, you know, beauty of this of the program where you meet people and, and she's someone I would have probably never encountered otherwise I don't think you know she uh set up all the telecom you know office during the Reagan era you know so she was really I mean her level of wisdom goes back decades and politically very different you know we have very different views but just so fascinating and I think that's really the gift uh that you know and, and all, of course all the friendships and the active alumni network of, of the term members and for the IAF, the International Affairs Fellowship, um, I did it about eight years into my career. And I think I, I you know, as Ahmed mentioned, I kind of picked these places. I, you know, Cairo, I love Egypt and was there during the revolution. So got evacuated in 2011, then went to Baghdad after that. Um, and we had a military withdrawal, so that was pretty intense. And then got uh, went back to Egypt because I loved Egypt. But got evacuated again in 2013. So just had a lot of just like really a lot of adventure, but a lot of like exhaustion honestly and so the IAF for me was just a moment to push pause because I didn't know if I wanted to stay in my career um I was sort of burning out um but also just to have a moment to like look at the world in a different way and so my fellowship actually um ended up being um at a human rights organization that worked with um dissidents largely from authoritarian regimes and focusing a lot on digital authoritarianism which at the time I knew nothing about I didn't it was uh, on the heels of um the murder, the tragic murder of Jamal Khashoggi, who was a member of this network, uh, the Human Rights Foundation. And so I ended up working with a Saudi dissident, Manal al Sharif, who was a colleague of Khashoggi's and was the architect behind um, the campaign to lift the driving ban in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but all of her co campaigners were thrown in jail. So we ended up doing this very creative road trip across the US, which I never would have done in my day job, but it was a fun you know, way to kind of meet dissidents and learn about the struggles that they're facing um, in a way that's so different than at the State Department where I'm having a formal briefing conversation. Like I developed a friendship and a sisterhood with someone that I never would have met um, and others as well within that network that now in my current job, I never would have predicted are, are so valuable because I now look at, um, you know, cyber, digital, emerging technology policy and how do we institute guardrails to protect people like Manal, you know, and others that are um, on the front lines that are fighting authoritarianism and especially, you know, in the in the cyber space. So um, so that's just a little bit of, um, you know, it was uh, very much transformational. I'd say both programs and in terms of my career, you know, led me into um, gave me the space to be able to kind of explore, but also helps me with my career in terms of next steps um, and, and in my progression. So. Um, just it's an honor to be on the panel with you know with with members of the, the team that I feel so connected to and so grateful um, to have been able to be a part of so um, with that I want to make sure we have plenty of time for Q&A so um, any questions from the audience feel free 
Um, and I think we're already getting some. So Ahmed, I'll let you read them and then we can start field because I'm on my phone. So. <laughs> sure, thank you. That was excellent. Um, yes, yeah, so folks, feel free to uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you for your questions or you can go ahead and post your questions in the in the chat. Um, uh, I can read one while we uh, we have a bunch of hands coming up. Uh, so uh, Iskander asked, what is the age limit for the International Affairs Fellowship? Uh, another question also asked from Bilal, uh, are the applications open only for applicants above 35 years old? So it's kind of similar. Oh, for the IAF or for the... Uh, for the IAF, there, we actually discussed this during the pa selection panel. Mm -hmm. um, it, there is no age limit uh, for the International Affairs Fellowship. And, you know, some people have nonlinear career paths and they join, you know, the Foreign Service. I know colleagues who join in their 40s or, you know, sort of mid-career. And so, yes, it, there is by design no age limit on the International Affairs Fellowship. But the idea is someone sort of at the midpoint of their career, however they've entered. Did I get that right, uh, Devin and Aliyah? Uh that's part I was just about to, the only thing that I would add is right we 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 do often see non-linear linear career paths for individuals coming from the military or maybe you know someone who spent a little bit more time to stay in school get their PhD um and so right it's it's really we 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 live leave that up to the individual applicants to assess whether this is the right time for them to take out uh to carry out an IAF um and just to make sure that that is um described uh and and how the IAF will contribute to their career moving forward um, in their application. Excellent. Uh, and the earlier question uh, on uh, programs under 35, another question came on that kind of uh, youth, uh, young professional topic as well. So we'll probably come back to that. I wanted to give Atif. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, but Megan, you could, or one of you guys could answer. There's the pipe. I, I think somebody. Yeah. Nancy had sent that, the pipeline. Yes, yeah, so we have, um, so with the term member program, right, we have an age range of 30 to 36 for applying. Um, but about five years ago, we started our Young Professionals Briefing Series. So we ask our all of our membership life and terms, so that's over 5,000 members, um, at, um, usually in the middle of the summer, to nominate um, two young professionals um, for this program. So it's nothing like the nomination for word term membership. It's just they submit two um, two people who they you know are are not at old enough yet to be um, term member applicants, um, but are you know they've graduated, they're into their career, so they tend to be mid to late twenties. Um, so they are invited to events once a month. We do um, an event for young professionals, either virtual or in Washington or in New York. Um, and it's a great way for us to showcase, um, you know, our scholars, like our fellows on a topic um, many times. And we're going to do this in early September. We're doing a, a joint young professionals and term member event. Um, it's going to be on sports washing. So we're having the panel in Washington. Um, our young professionals are um, and it's it's really an email list that we, we just update every year in August. Um, they'll be invited to join that in person. Term members are also invited to join that. Um, and then we'll show it virtually to those who can't make it to Washington. So it's a great way to expose people under 30 to the work of the council, um, get them familiar with what we do, potentially meet, um, you know, possible nominators or seconders, um, you know, who might be term members when the time is right for them to apply. Um, and the application timing really is uh, different for everyone. Um, you know, it's um, some people apply right at 30 and um, they might get held over. So they'll try again the next year. It's very common for people to, to apply a couple of times um, because it, you know, it is very competitive and if somebody's 36, you know, in the applicant pool. They have six years more experience than perhaps a 30 year old. So it's, you know, everything really is taken um, into consideration um, about, you know, career and career path. Um, but the way we've really tried to kind of start people thinking about it is with that young professional. Excellent. Let's uh, jump into one or two uh, questions from the members verbally, and then we'll go back to the chat. Uh, Atif, uh, please ask your question. 
Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, first of all, I really love this uh, event. I learned so much. I don't remember being as excited um, in a while. So this is great, guys. Um, I had a question about the term program. So um, if I work on like international affairs issues, and I sometimes get to go to DC for work, but I'm not based in DC, is 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 the term program you know uh, kind of uh, realistic for me, or, or is it like, yeah, I would just love to to know what you think about that. That's a great question. And it I it really is. And if it's one thing that was good and positive to come out of COVID, this is it. Um, so historically speaking, the overall council membership, we always used to say was a third New York, a third Washington, and a third everywhere else, which we refer to as our national members. That has shifted so much with the pandemic. Um, uh, with for obvious reasons, people, you know, moving all over, they can work remotely. But also in the past 15 years, we've seen a real shift in where our term members are. Um, about 37% are based in Washington, only 18% in New York and the rest elsewhere. Um, so we have a huge chunk of our membership, both term and life, that are not in the two cities where we have building presence, right? Um, you know, in New York, we have our headquarters on 68th Street and Park. And then we also have a building in Washington on F Street. Um, you know, where the pandemic really helped it, though, is we do so much um, virtually like we're doing today. Um, prior to the pandemic, if we had a not for attribution, so a Chatham House Rules event in our big meeting room in New York, um, if you didn't attend in person, like you weren't getting it unless we might teleconference it to members outside of New York. And then they could like email in a question. Now the playing the playing field is so much more equal. We, you know. Almost everything we do from our building in New York or Washington will also offer via Zoom to our members. And they're, you know, they're raising their hands and they're being called on and verbally asking a question. It's coming through the speakers in the main room. Um, you know, for term members, um, so much of what we do, again, is virtual. We have our annual conference. We, we have trips that take place outside of, of New York and Washington. Um, and if you're actually based outside of those two cities and a term member, you're also getting um, programming that our another team, our national team is doing for, for national members. So that's an extra conference in June. That's a symposium on the West Coast every December. That's um, access to smaller roundtables in 11 cities um, across the U.S. and in London. Um, and more and more, we're trying to use technology to bring term members together. There's an unofficial CFR does not oversee it WhatsApp group. Um, and there's an overall like federation WhatsApp group. And then they've started 13 other channels and they're connecting on everything about emerging markets, about US politics, which gets dicey sometimes, but you know, things on tech. Um, there one was just started on MENA issues. Like it's, you know, this is all kind of term member led and it's really all just a way to come together. And that is a mix of people from all over. So um, we do a mentor program for term members in their second year where we pair them with a life member as a formal mentor. We do that for all term members, not just the ones based in, you know, in one of our two kind of, you know, cities where we have our presence. So, um, you know, if you'd asked that question five years ago, I'd have been like, yeah, it's worth it. But now it's like I, it's everyone's, you know, got equal access. Um, so um. yeah, I would echo Megan. It's so true because I remember when I was overseas and I remember posted in Pakistan, I, you'd have to call in like a teleconference oh, line and I didn't do it because I was like, I want, I want to be there. But it's so phenomenal now because of the hybrid. And one thing, just to remind folks, like a lot of these are recorded, so you know yeah. for interested in like looking at CFR, not everything, the ones that are not for attribution are not recorded, but a lot of the events are actually yeah. on, you can watch them and there's such great resources and CFR has a podcast, Why It Matters, really well done um, and incredibly, you know, it may, meant to be accessible. So if you're not an expert in a particular area, then you can kind of, you know, get some literacy on, on some issues. So it's, but I agree a thousand percent, the technology and that WhatsApp channel, those channels, like, they can take over your life a little bit. <laughs> I know. But it's, it's really fun. It's so cool. Yeah. But it's, it is all about the connecting. Um, and, um, you know, I'm we're hearing that more and more and more. Um, just how do we lower 
the friction to connect. Um, and there's so much great camaraderie and it's, it's, it's special. It truly is in that way. Um, on that note on connecting, there's another question from uh, Iskandar from also one of our members at the State Department. Uh, any recommendations on how to find CFR nominators? Um, I imagine he's talking about the term program. Uh, if our network is limited, also should other recommenders be uh, CFR members to the competitive sure. to be competitive during the application process? So if you're at the State Department, you have a ton of options. I mean, look at, um, I think I, I could have this number wrong, but I feel like I just did a search of the 764 term members um, that we have and like, um, it, there might even be a hundred people that are at state. Like it's you, you just honestly take 10 minutes and look at the list of, of members that we have a full list of our 5,000 members online, go through it, compare it with your database at state. Like it's, if anything, like somebody at the state Mar state department is sitting better than anybody else, as far as kind of being able to, to connect. Um, and you know, like if you all have Slack channels or things like that, ask for former term members, right? I mean, Miriam also too can be a huge resource in that way. Um, for term member applications, your nominator needs to be a, a, um, a member. Um, your seconders do not have to be. Um, if you have, if, if it's apples to apples, you've got four people who could write you seconding letters and you're trying to pick two of them and two of them are and like, they all know you equally can all speak equally about what you have in, to offer, uh, I would go for the member, um, you know, uh, if you can. But it's it's definitely not a requirement and it's, it, it won't hold you back. It's, you know, your focus on very thoughtful letters, people who can talk about, you know, what you've achieved, um, your standing amongst your peers, why, um, you know, why the council should take you. Um, but then also what you'll get from the council. Like this is, you know, your future achievement and, and what your your career path will be and like, you know, how the council or how the term membership, you know, will play a huge role in that for you. You know, I, I think it's it's really important to focus on people who know you and can speak thoughtfully about you. Um, if all that's equal, go for the members. But if not, it's it, it's it's definitely not a requirement for, for term membership. And just to add to that, because I, I when I was on the selections panel for the IAF, which I think is similar in some ways with the recommendations, mm -hmm. not so much, I mean, or Devin and Aaliyah can correct me and Megan, Megan can correct me, but, um, you know, there we have, there were like brand name, amazing, you know, people that know you well, then you really want people who know you well, who can just speak yeah. to you as a person that had known you for more, you know, of some time frame and can talk about observed behavior, whether it's you're in a work setting or academic or mm -hmm. um, even as a, I had the mentor I met that I mentioned, you know, who worked on the film, you know, we just got to know each other so well that she ended up becoming uh, a nominator, I think, for the I because she was really could know knew me well. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so, that, so that's well, like, you, you have to remember that these committees see so many letters. Like, I mean, it's just for all of them to remember I have like you know, they're not new to this. So like they can read between the lines too. If you just picked a big name who doesn't know you, like they've seen it, they get it. Like it's, so it's, you know, like put the time and thought and effort into finding people who, who are, are going to really speak and be your supporters. They're your nominators. They're there um, saying why the council should have you. Right. And why you should be in the council. And, you know, again, for term membership, it can be really tricky. Like, you know, people get held over and, happens all the time for membership and they try again. I am constantly like blown away. I'll have, and I'm not part of the term membership committee. I get term members after. So I don't see that the, the applications. Um, and so it's funny, I'll, I'll term members, I'll get to know well and talk to them and be like, it took me two times to get in here. And I'm like, really? Like, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing and don't be discouraged, but make sure you've got people who truly support you, you know, writing on your behalf. Excellent. That was great. Thank you. Um, we'll go over to the uh, raised hand. Anyone else have questions? Please raise your hands now and we'll call on you uh, as we wrap up. Uh, Hamza, please ask your question. Hi, thanks so much for those uh, for those presentations. Um, so I'm listening to this as someone who's 24. It's a pretty early career. So I have two quick questions. One of them is uh, on the young, the, the young professional, the briefing series. Um, so should I just ask colleagues I know who are term members or life members about that? And you say the timeline for that is August. And then second question is, 
um, just on, uh, as I'm thinking about grad school, I, I just wanted to know from a selection committee, what I'm trying to figure out what people, you know, what the evaluation of a grad degree is and what the comparison between grad school and work experience is like, are they interchangeable or do most of the people coming and have a grad degree to credential, you just need to make it work in the field or are things changing where it's like, if you have relevant work experience, it just eclipses or can, you know, is analogous to a grad school degree. Thanks. So the question about the young professionals, you know, we send out the notification in August, but yeah, definitely tell somebody, you know, be like, hey, I'd love to be a part of this. They'll shoot an email to meetings at CFR.org and say, love to have Hamza do this. Here's his contact. We'll put you on the list. Um, you may not be on the list in time for the September. I think it's like sixth event if that comes together, but we'll do something in October. We also send monthly newsletters uh, to this group. I should have flagged that as well. So you'll be in pretty close, you know, like pretty regular touch with the council. Um, you know, for the grad thing, the best thing I can say for this, I'd be curious to have uh, everyone else, Aaliyah, Devin, and Miriam talk about it. You know, if you are currently in a grad program, wait until you're finished with it before you apply for term membership anyway. Um, it, it, it's more about, you know, professional experience. Um, but um, to be honest, I don't know the answer of having that degree. I mean, having that degree is going to help you in your career, most likely, perhaps with the next job or something. So that's going to be what adds to your term member application. Um, I, I wouldn't be in grad school applying for term membership um, is what I would recommend. But I don't How do my colleagues feel about that? Elliot, did you want to take I, this one? I will say just for the overseas programs, I will mention that um, none of them um, fund pre or PhD research uh, work toward a degree or the completion of projects um, for you know, for towards a degree, um, one of our elig eligibility requirements is that applicants must hold at least a bachelor's degree. The selection committee, every single selection committee takes this process very seriously and they weigh all the different aspects of the application and, you know, your your educational achievements are just one part of that whole process. Um, so whether you have a, a, a higher degree or not, I wouldn't say make or break your application. They really um, put a lot of emphasis on on the proposal, how timely, how relevant it is, um, and everything else should obviously just bolster you as a um, as an ideal candidate. Um, so you know, I I, I would say that it's. It, it probably wouldn't make too much of a difference, but I definitely would, if you're working towards a degree, I would f wait to finish the degree before applying for any of the overseas fellowships. It would make it very difficult to be overseas and also do, yeah, ha be in graduate yeah. school. Uh, excellent. Uh, we have uh, Rahaf, uh, you, you want to feel free to uh, read your question out, or should I, I don't mind reading it in the comments. I have uh, one of our members at USAID. Um, yeah, so I'm. Oh, awesome. I'm there. It. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much for um, taking the time to join and um, share with us a lot of these interesting opportunities. Um, I wanted to ask about the term membership. I was looking at the application, and it seems that it's largely based on your resume um, and these nominating letters, and not so much on a written essay or an interview, right. so not to so essentially these two dimensions to get a feel for your um, work. But there's also, yeah, a lot of people who are great practitioners in the foreign policy space, um, a lot to offer, and also likely will have great personal letters. So I was just wondering if you could share maybe a little bit more about what you think in this space kind of distinguishes some of these um, applications that you're looking for. Uh, and I guess essentially, how do you suss that you're the right fit for this um, membership? It's a great question and it is it is so individualized. I mean, there you're right, there is no interview um, and you don't submit a written statement. That's why it's so important to have, um, you know, people that can, you, you do that for you, right? And talk about um, what you bring to the council. I, I think the way, I kind of look at it two things like for people who are applying for a life membership, I always say like it should be about like what you bring to the council. 
I think for term membership, you know, we really are, this is, it really is what we think of as cultivating the next group of leaders. So like, why are you that, that leader? They should be able to, I mean, there are lots of great practitioners. They may not be great people. Like, you know, you want somebody who can like say great, you know, how, how wonderful you are and why you are that next leader. But then also like what being part of this program will do to help you achieve, um, you know, what your goals are and and where you're going. Um, you know, hearing, you know, my colleagues talk about the amazing people that have come through the IAF, we, the term member program is the same. Like, you know, John Kerry was one of our founding term members, right? And when we had 12 term members to start back in the 60s, and then it's just grown and or 70s, got to keep doing the math wrong, in the early 70s, 1970. Um, and, um, you know, we've had, you know, amazing people come through this program. And it's about finding the right folks who can who can see that about you. And look, I mean, if you, that's, that's not a great answer to your, to your question, because it is so individualized. So reach out to us, like, let us talk directly to you, like what, you, what your career is, what you're doing now what your path is and who you're thinking about. Like, you know, there, there's a, a fair amount of, you know, strategizing that goes into this too. So, you know, like Miriam and Ahmed have my contact information, um, you know, feel free to touch base with them. And, and then when we can have that conversation as well, um, because it, it, it's, it's not an, it's not an easy thing, but it's, you know, if you're here now in this conversation, you're, you're already kind of working in this space most likely. Um, so it's just building on that. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, how, how the council will, will help you get there. Excellent. I think we have five minutes left. If there's any last questions while our panelists can perhaps feel free to, um, you know, share whatever email addresses you're comfortable sharing with the group here, or you can give it permission to share it with them afterwards. Uh, any questions? Um, uh, thank you, Rahaf. Uh, follow up point. Oh, um, can I just, please. Yeah, I, I would just love to quick, quickly add, you know, Megan was talking about the value of, you yeah. know, the lists of these term, the ter current term members, former term members that are posted on CFR.org. We have similar resources on each of our individual fellowships pages of the program alumni. Um, some of them have, you know, what the fellows worked on while they were there, where they went, how long they were there. Um, so that's another great resource. Um, you know, obviously we don't have their contact information, but it is a good place to start just in terms of sourcing your network for people to talk to about the IAF. Um, um, uh, to learn about, you know, their career paths, um, you know, again, to get a sense of what the right timing is for your own personal, you know, uh, what is mid-career for you and, and what would be transformative for your career and when that would when that would take place. Um, so I do encourage you to look at our alumni lists. Um, and I don't believe we've posted it in the chat yet, but um, we just uh, created a really lovely video um, that have some of our recent alumni talking about their experience. Um, so please go ahead and watch that if you're interested in learning more. Um, and that does speak a little bit to each of the different IAF programs. So there should be a little bit of something for everyone in there. Excellent. Uh, if there's no other questions, I'll share the video in the chat as well. If there's folks who have any last minute, really quick questions for our panelists, otherwise Maria will, will close us off with the concluding remarks, perhaps. Uh, um, barring any additional questions from our members and attendees. And there okay, is I will. I will add one more plug in, Miriam. This might be be in your closing remarks. Um, but as Aliyah mentioned, our IAF programs are all open now through October 31st. Um, our fellowships e email inbox uh, con e contact is in the chat already, but that's fellowships at CFR.org. So please reach out. Those emails go to both Aaliyah and I on all of our open IAF programs. So if you have any questions either about your eligibility or about the application itself, um, and, and you're welcome to, if it's not this year for, for some of our younger professionals on the call, um, you, you're welcome to take a look at the application. Even if you don't end up submitting, it'll just give you a good feel for what's on the application, what you can expect in the future. Um, so I do encourage you to, to, to take a look. Yes, that's correct. Uh, October 31st for the uh, IAF fellowship and January 10th is at the next deadline uh, for the term membership program. That's exactly right. 
excellent. So everyone should get ready and feel free to, <laughs> you know, reach out to your resources and so on. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's never too soon to to really start thinking about, um, you know, who who you would have in your corner um, writing for you. It's just a good exercise, frankly, to go through to think about people who really support where you are professionally. It's not something I frankly do enough. Um, and uh, you know, even if it's not related to term membership or the IEF, but you know, we should all be looking for allies, right. As we're kind of navigating, um, you know, this, this kind of professional time in our lives. So it's, it's just a great exercise anyway, to go through and think about who, who you would go to, um, to, to say who you are and where you're going. Um, and whether that, you know, relates to the term member program and the IEF or the council at all. Um, I would just recommend that anyway, and hopefully that will lead you to us. Sorry, not to preach. <laughs> yes, no, that was perfect. Maddie, you want to close this off or otherwise? Sure. I mean, I just really just want to thank uh, Megan, Devin, uh, Aliyah, Ahmed for pulling this together for all of the really insightful and wonderful questions, all of you who attended. Um, you know, this recording, we'll be sharing it. So if you want to rewatch it or, you know, um, in addition to the, all the links and resources, uh, email addresses to ask, you know, follow up questions, you know, feel free. This is meant to be interactive and the beginning of a conversation. So um, and please share with your networks. You know, I know the council um, has been doing a phenomenal job with trying to diversify and be more inclusive in terms of the, which is why we're, we're doing this, uh, this particular session, but in general, you know, so if you have ideas for, um, you know, others that might be interested at whatever career phase, whether it's pre-term member for this sort of young professionals pipeline, the term member program, the International Affairs Fellowship, um, and eventually, you know, I did the pipeline, now I'm a life member, like, you know, I love it, like, it's really a great uh, program. So I um, and I've gained so much from it. So if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer. But really just a huge, huge thank you uh, for the time and the gener generosity of your time. And we'll end right at one. This is a CFR custom. So we are we are in your world. And so we are um, and I want to be respectful. I know everyone's busy. So big thanks again. Thanks, thank, thank you, you so much you. for having us. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Bye, have everyone. Bye-bye.